20 different anime made the summer season quite the unorthodox experience. Let's talk about it. Welcome back to the channel, everybody. Today, we're going to go over the anime summer season 2023. The first one we're going to talk about is Level 1 Demon Lord and One Room Hero. The story in a nutshell tells the story of Max the Hero and his companions. They defeated the evil Demon Lord and now 10 years later peace has arrived and unexpectedly the Demon Lord has awoken earlier than anticipated but now he's in the body of a small child and he is seeking the former hero for revenge, a rematch of his encounter but what he finds is very surprising. Surprising. Max is sort of a shut-in slob. He has some troubled history with uh, the general public and the media after a falling out because of certain actions that he took with some ladies out there, and that tarnished his reputation and sort of left him as a shut-in. So an unlikely friendship forms between the Demon Lord, who is now this cute tiny kid, and Max the hero, and it was really wholesome. And if I had to pick one of the best couples for 2023 is definitely Max and the Demon Lord. They have a really nice chemistry and at first Max is unsure of how it's gonna go because you know this is his former enemy nemesis if you will but as the story moves along with more comedic beats and all that stuff they actually get along pretty well and form a friendship and the Demon Lord is trying to help Max get back into shape and become that hero that everybody knew. So that is one of the main shticks of this series and if it stayed like that, I feel like it wouldn't make an impression. Fortunately, the series goes into pretty interesting political subplots as you see a neighboring territory that one of the former heroes has claimed for himself and is building a country out of it. And the main piece of land, the main continent is upset about this because they feel that land belongs to them. So there is political agendas and arguments and fights and all that stuff. And that is sort of going to force our hero to pick a side or pick nobody's side and I thought that was really good. Overall, level 1 Demon Lord, it's funny, I liked it. I think it replicates the art style of the original manga pretty well. It's a nicely done adaptation and because the manga is still ongoing, the story isn't too far along so the anime had to improvise certain scenes, add a little bit of filler here and there towards the end, but it was actually really well done. If I could pick one negative aspect about it would be the actual animation for it. I don't think it's up to par when you compare it to Tofu's art in the manga, which I do think is superior in every way. But overall, it's a fun anime to check out. Sin Duality Noir. This story takes place in the not so distant future of the year 2222 or 2222, however you pronounce it. It's been years since the tears of the new moon, a mysterious rain poured and wiped out almost the entire human race. The poisonous rain gave birth to deformed creatures devouring humans and humanity has fled from the danger. As a means for survival, the humans then build an underground haven in this newly built dystopian city. In pursuit of maintaining their existence, they run into artificial intelligence named Magus. Not knowing how things will work between them, this is the story of how humans and AI coincide and work together towards finding the truth. I first learned about it because of the game that's coming out called Sin Duality Echo of Ada. This was announced a while ago as of the recording of this video. It's a third person shooter action RPG developed by Game Studio and it is going to be published by Bandai Namco Entertainment. Sin Duality itself is a mixed media project. That means you're getting anime, manga, light novels, video games, I'm sure figures and all that cool stuff. I'm pretty sure they're going to do a cell phone game. I don't know. I thought the anime had some really nice ideas. I like the whole mecha roller skating units to fight these weird monsters. That's cool to defend uh, what's left of humanity and all that stuff. Fantastic. I like the idea of the AI Magus and how they are incorporated into the machine and with their pilot and all that stuff. That's pretty cool. Now, where Sin Duality Noir loses me is that out of the 12 episodes that aired, you 
really don't get a whole lot of plot development and what little you do is left for the back burner in favor of standalone episodes, comedic scenarios, uh, drama between the characters that ultimately doesn't amount to much when it comes to the main plot of the story. And we know it's not going to go that route because it is mixed media, it is part of a larger world building exercise. I'm pretty sure that when we play the game, it's going to fill in some gaps. And when you read the manga or when you read the light novel, etc, etc, it's going to fill in gaps for the overall mythos of this franchise. So in that regard, I was not loving Sinduality Noir. I think the animation studio that worked on it, which is 8-bit studios, I think they did a really good job. Everything looked nice because it's Bandai. I like the little nods to arcade gaming, but like I said, it's the hollow bits and pieces from a missing plot that really hurts Noir from being something more. It was fine, and by the end of it, you do get some type of explanation to whatever the heck's going on, but we really don't know. We get characters that can feel stereotypical, and we get a lead pilot that is unsure of himself and goes through the whole motions of, of self-doubt and uh, gaining that self-esteem back and becoming a better person and and a better uh, pilot fighter, if you will, and the mystery of the Magus that he finds, Noir, who doesn't know anything about herself or itself, and she's now trying to recover her memories, where she came from, who made her, that sort of stick, which we've seen before in other shows. So overall, I just thought it was okay. Nothing too great, but nothing bad either. It was serviceable. We finally had the second half of Ayakashi Triangle. This is insane. This show started in January of 2023. It aired for, I think it was four episodes, just one month. Then because of COVID, it got hit with massive delays. They had to shut down production. And I think like four or five months later, it came back or four months, I should say, for one episode and then a recap. And then they restarted broadcast from the beginning and then by by August, I think it was, the show came back to finish its run of 12 episodes. And overall, I mean, God bless you if you like Ayakashi Triangle. I wanted to like this because of the yokai aspect. I think that is its strongest point. Unfortunately, it's hindered by the abundant, egregious usage of fan service. And I'm not like the most puritanical person out there. Don't get me wrong. I, if you enjoy that stuff, more power to you. But this was, I found, cheaply made. It's just so comically oriented towards the fan service that it deterred from me taking any emotional aspect out of the story. I really did not care what was happening because at the end of the day, I knew it was just a scene was setting up another scene to lead into fan service -y stuff. Even at its most dire, you still get that stuff, which kind of ruined the excitement for me. I do like the fact that they're using the Ayakashi stuff and uh, Shirogane, the cat, I think he's wonderful. He's my favorite part of the show, or I guess the manga. So uh, that was fun. But I, I, I don't know. This felt like a very early odds uh, fan service anime that somehow snuck into 2023. And I am so sorry uh, for the people that love it. I, I, I'm hating on it, but uh, you do you. That's awesome. I also enjoy some things that people don't like. So it's a trade off, I guess. The girl I like forgot her glasses. Essentially, this is a rom-com adapting the manga of the same name. The studio that worked on it is Go Hands, which has a reputation, which I'll get to in a minute. The story is about these two kids who are friends at school and the boy is in love with the girl, but the girl is kind of a ditz and she keeps forgetting her glasses, which leads to comical things happening in the story. Now, the bigger twist here, if I can even call it that, is that she's always Always forgetting her glasses, which is pretty silly because in real life you would fix that right away, but for the purposes of this show, it's going to continue happening. I think the biggest thing here is the fact that the two lead characters are cute, wholesome, and you want to root for them. Now, the art, on the other hand, I thought it was great. Gohans did a phenomenal job. It got some heat when it first started because of their usage of 3D motion and the way everything was zooming in and out like a freaking fisheye lens or an early 2000s music video. And the fact that Mie's hair 
was, as I've heard online, kind of symbiotic in nature. It took a life of its own. In a regular scene, she would move her head and the hair would keep on moving. But as you went along with the series, that died down significantly. Unfortunately, with rom-coms, especially with the high school romance subgenre, if you will, it's always the same format of these episodic adventures at school and what little progress is made is saved towards the end. And when the finale comes, there's a big uh, twist or uh, improvement in said relationship which makes you hopeful for another season and then it's sort of a rinse repeat scenario. So in that aspect I was a little bit disappointed then again I'm so used to it by now I've seen so many of these shows so yeah if it does come back that's great but I don't think this is a show that I'll uh, come back to but it was cute nonetheless. Helk made by Satellite and it is is based on the manga of the same name from Nanaki Nanao, and this is an alternate world. At first I thought it was Earth, but it's not. This is a country in the demon world, and they are holding a tournament to select the new demon king. There are the Imperial Four Heavenly Kings. They are in charge of the tournament, and one of the individuals participating is a human, the hero called Helk, who is supposed to be their enemy. After receiving news of the fall of the castle of of Urum, before the finals of the tournament, the main Imperial Lieutenant Vermilio sets out to retake the castle with Helk and other finalists. Now the twist here being that Helk is in favor of destroying the humans. So you're thinking, well, how can that be? The demons don't really get it either, but they become so enamored with Helk because he is such a, a bolder, larger than life personality. He's so wholesome and nice and they just accept him right away. So that leads into the story of Helk. There's a lot of stuff that happens in this, which I'm not going to reveal. I didn't think I was going to love it at first. I thought it was going to be sort of middle of the road for me. But as I started watching, it had that quirky combination of it being action packed. It doesn't take itself too seriously, but it has dramatic moments. I like Vermilio. I think she is the best aspect of the show. I like how she's so upset that Helk, this human, is participating in this tournament. It's sacrilegious, but everybody around her doesn't seem to mind the contestant all and the audience all seem to love Helk and they're going in applauding his every move and you're thinking is Helk really here to become part of this realm isn't he like a spy doesn't like is there a hidden agenda isn't he supposed to hate demons because he's a human Vermilio of course figuring out that maybe I can trust this guy and setting aside their differences or her prejudice to allow Helk to help her retake the castle and all that stuff. So yeah, that in a huge nutshell, I'm, I'm all over the place, but bear with me. Every episode ends on a great cliffhanger. Not everybody can do that properly. It takes finesse to end your in episodes on huge cliffhangers and aggravating your audience, but at the same time, they're excited for the next episode. And that's how I felt watching Hulk. So I do wholeheartedly recommend it. I thought it was great. I like the art. Sometimes it was okay uh, art-wise, but the the overall look of it, I really enjoyed. My Happy Marriage. This came as a surprise. I didn't know about it. And the fact that this was done by um, Kinema Citrus was interesting, but it had me concerned because they made Made in Abyss, which artistically speaking is fantastic, regardless of what you may think about the plot. But the visuals on the show and the movie are phenomenal. They also made Rising of the Shield a hero. Season one was great, but season two was horrendous in my opinion. So 50-50 here. I was a little bit nervous going in and I am happy to say that I absolutely love this and it was the highlight of the season for me and I'm telling you right now, easily one of the best shows of 2023 and one of the best shows of the season. So we follow the character of Mio who lost her birth mother at a young age and ended up growing up being abused by her stepmother, stepsister and father, unfortunately, despite her being born into a noble family. Now this is an alternate Japan 
Japan where the supernatural stuff exists and they use it willingly and you have these families with supernatural users to combat, I guess, supernatural threads. I didn't really pay too much attention to it. I was more invested into the drama of these characters. And honestly, I'm a fan of folklore and Japanese supernatural stuff and yokai. If, if you've watched my channel, you know of this. But for my happy marriage, I didn't really need that. I was happily invested in the drama happening with the characters. So as the story develops, Mio finds out that she is going to be married off and the soon to be husband has a reputation of being cruel and heartless. In fact, he's had numerous previous fiancés who have all fled his household, none lasting even a mere three days. Resigned to the fact that her family had abandoned her, Mio knocks on the gate of the Kudo household to find herself greeted by a beautiful man with pale skin. Despite the poor treatment she receives from her husband-to-be during their first meeting, Mio is unable to return to her old home and spends her time cooking and doing chores. However, as the days pass, Mio and Kyoka begin to slowly open their hearts to each other. So I cheated a little bit and read you the official description, but I think it does a good job of letting you know what this series is about. I think it was wonderful. I love Mio and her relationship with uh, Kyoka. I was extremely pissed off at the treatment that she received from her stepmother, stepsister, and father. That was hard to watch at times and I was really annoyed, but it felt like watching a good soap opera. I was so emotionally invested and I just wanted nothing but the best for this young girl. I enjoyed the art from Kinema Citrus. Like I said, they knocked it out of the park. I think it's one of their best works so far and you really did feel like you were part of that world. It really transported you to that era, in my opinion. The relationship between Mio and Kyoka and the marriage uh, takes the full season to fully develop and resolve itself somewhat. But the main aspect that surprised me was the fact that when they find out that she's going to this house, uh, the stepsister is a little bit jealous and they're plotting things to ruin that marriage and all that stuff. I was surprised that that was cut short and it resolves itself halfway to the season. I thought it was going to be a full subplot to it, but no. Overall, fantastic characters, a well-written show. I've heard from fans of this franchise that the anime speeds things up and changes a few things, the pacing and all that stuff, and omits stuff from uh, the original light novels, which I suspected, you know, that not everything's going to be adapted 100%, but as a non-light novel reader, I got everything. I loved it, and it made me excited to watch more, so I'm looking forward to the second part of this story, too air, which is going to be next year. Reborn as a vending machine, I now wander the dungeon. I was really excited. It's so quirky and dumb, the fact that it's an isekai series and the main character, he is a huge nerd and after a traffic accident, he <laughs> dies and is reborn into another world as a vending machine. Sure, why not? We're gonna go with that. <laughs> Let's do it. And he can't talk, but there's a computer AI thing Maybe it's an otherworldly thing. I don't know. That's talking to him in his head. And there's a RPG point like system embedded into his consciousness as a vending machine. God, this sounds so dumb, but it helps him navigate through the series. He can't talk, but as a vending machine, there's a little speaker grill, or I guess, and he's able to uh, say a couple lines like have a good day or not this or good luck next time. So he's going to use those voice commands to sort of teach people into like yes or no questions and answers, you know? And that's all you need to know. It, it's it's a wacky series that it has a blast doing its thing. It may not be the best one, but it's comedic enough where you can just switch off your brain and enjoy uh, Reborn as a vending machine. Eventually, our main protagonist, he becomes friends with this girl who is quickly enamored by this vending machine and finds a friendship there, as strange as that sounds. And they go off on adventures, like guild adventures, and they go after like huge monsters and there's a couple like subplots with other characters that want to take advantage of the vending machine because they find that he has all these magical items that can feed everybody and the, the food is so different than what they're used to so of course they want to get in on that action and steal that power you know regular things that happen in isekai about somebody being reborn as a vending machine so now they're wandering dungeons typically normal stuff right uh studio gokumi did the art here with axes and for the most part, it 
it, it's okay. There's a lot of misfires for uh, this anime. Certain scenes just don't look that great and look pretty ugly, in my opinion. Actually, the key visuals, I thought it was going to be like that all around, and I was a little bit naive because it doesn't look like that half the time. I just thought it was a very middle of the road series with a quirky enough premise that it carries everything along and you don't mind the show's faults, if that makes sense. Saint Cecilia and Pastor Lawrence. Cecilia is beloved by the townspeople. Not only is she elegant and composed, she benevolently shares her wisdom with all who seek it. That is, until the last person has left, at which point she becomes totally hopeless. Only Pastor Lawrence is keeping the saint put together enough to do her duties, and though she may test him, it's all in a day's work. I'll be honest with you guys, I decided to watch this because I had 19 shows and thought, hey, let's just round it out to 20 because that's cooler. But I ended up kind of liking Saint Cecilia. You see, this is sort of a weird mashup by Hazano Kazutake, the original mangaka, of many Judeo-Christian things bundled up together in one nonsensical rom-com of a show. I mean, technically it's not supposed to go the route of a rom-com, but it kind of is. You heard the premise here. You follow these characters in this church and the spotlight here, the shining beacon of recommendations for St. Cecilia and Pastor Lawrence is St. Cecilia herself really well done character. She is extremely adorable, clumsy, wholesome, and well acted. They really did a good job at this, and that is the best compliment I can give this series. Typically, I am a fan of anything Doga Kobo does as a studio. I love most of their shows, and this uh, was all right. It's very middle of the road. Uh, nothing really happens. You just sort of see the dynamic between the saint and the pastor, and you sort of learn the tragic history of the saints that came before and how the populace handled that and now they don't want to go that route so that was pretty interesting the relationship stuff kind of weirded me out a little bit but whatever it, it's an anime i'm not gonna question things here uh just uh, know that it's pretty chill and wholesome if you just want to have a fun time and not have to think too much about what's going on with the plot and just enjoy the cute interactions then yeah check out uh, saint cecilia and Pastor Lawrence. We also had the finale for Sacrificial Princess and the King of Beasts. I thought this was phenomenal. And if you would have told me that in 2023, I was going to get two shows where they tackle the subject of discrimination and racism in the backdrop of an anthropomorphic kingdom of animals, I would have said you were lying. But Sacrificial Princess goes for it, and I think it's a pretty cool success. I liked the series all throughout its 24 episode run. I think it had a nice ending. I would have wanted more story time, but they adapted the whole manga, so that's great. We rarely see that these days. JC Staff is notorious. Some people dislike their art style and their adaptations, but I happen to enjoy what they did here. There are a couple instances of bad animation sprinkled throughout, but it was nothing too wild that I felt like, oh, this is unwatchable. It was pretty watchable, and you had some uh, fantastic characters, especially with Sarifi. She is the heart and soul of this series and how she's able to rise up from being a sacrifice to being the queen of this kingdom, falling in love with the Beast King. And as a result, the whole society kind of starts changing by the fact that she's there. It takes a while. And obviously there are some prejudices there from the rest of the animal populace, but that sort of imitates life and as they get to know her, they all come around to the notion that, hey, maybe humans aren't that bad. And likewise, she tries to tell the other humans that, hey, not all the beasts are bad. Let's just get along. I thought that was a really nice message and I dug it. I think it was a solid adaptation all throughout. 
Undead Murder Farce from Lapin Track. I hope I pronounced that correctly. This is adapting the manga of the same name. And in the 19th century, a world inhabited by vampires, werewolves, and other paranormal creatures, there is an immortal beauty who happens to be a disembodied head. She is Aya Rindo. Now she is traveling alongside the half-human, half-demon demon killer, Sugaru Shunichi, and her loyal maid, Shizuko Hase, as they travel through Europe as the supernatural detective, the cage user, solving supernatural mysteries while she searches for her lost body. This ended up being one of my favorite shows of the season, and at the end of this year, I will be adding it to my list of favorite shows of 2023. I thought this was super unique. I didn't know about the original source material, so this was a brand new experience here. I think they knocked it out of the park. I love the artwork, the character designs, and the fact that it's mixing all the right elements for me. The supernatural stuff. I am a huge fan of creature horror when it comes to like, you know, vampires, zombies, werewolves, etc. Thanks to the demon killer character of Sugaru, you get the Japanese Japanese yokai. So yeah, we get more of the European side of things when it comes to creatures and all that, but it's good. You have Aya, she is an immortal, she is searching for her lost body, and that is one of the first starting mysteries to find out who has done this. When you find out, it's pretty cool because it features a lot of characters that you know from European fiction and mystery novels and all that stuff. Unfortunately, the first case that they're solving, I thought it lasted way too long for such a simple case it really does pick up and gets really good. I highly recommend it, regardless of that opening act. Even though you might not understand where the story's headed or where the clues are to solve the case, you still have a lot of fun with the characters and the dialogue and banter that happens between the three main characters of Aya, Shizuku, and Sugaru. That is one of the highlights for me for uh, Undead Murder Farce. I really wasn't going to watch Jujutsu Kaisen season two. I have to be frank with you guys. I don't understand yet why I don't like it as a lot of you do. I think it's well made. I enjoy the reading the manga, even though I'm not up to date with it. I like what Mappa's doing with the anime, but for some reason it just doesn't really click with me, which is weird. I don't mind shows like this, but here we have season two, which I think is a lot better than season one uh, from a technical standpoint. I can't really form a huge opinion on it, but the first part does deal with Gojo and Geto, younger versions of them obviously, as they are escorting a young Riko Amanai to Master Tengen. That six episode arc I thought was great. That could have been a movie and it would have been amazing. Seriously, Mappa was just flexing hard with the animation at work with, uh, with those six episodes. Then the Shibuya incident arc begins and we're going through that at the moment. It has wonderful animation, but again, I don't know. I think some of the plot elements are just not exciting to me. But still, if you loved season one, if you like the manga, of course, you're going to enjoy season two of Jujutsu Kaisen. So I'm not going to be a roadblock in your decision to either watch it or not, you know? Rent a Girlfriend Season 3. This uh, anime is a guilty pleasure for a lot of people. At this point, I need to inform you that I do read the manga physically, and I and I like it. You know, it, it's nothing too grand. Uh, the main protagonist can be a hassle, can be quite annoying for some people, and I totally get that. But I think I like it initially. I liked it because of the college setting. I'm not necessarily a fan of the high school romance stuff. I, I'm not intrigued or interested interested in that all too much, but setting it with quote unquote older characters was interesting. Uh, obviously I don't agree with the whole <laughs> girlfriend renting system. I think that's dumb, but whatever, what are you going to do? Uh, that's, that's the plot of this series. Uh, but in this third season, we finally get the conclusion of the uh, production, movie production arc for uh, Chizuru and Kazuya. And that has a very uh, well done dramatic ending to it that uh, will, I mean, if you're invested, I think it'll tear you up and I, I enjoyed it. And yet some of that stuff in the resolution, I think brings down the series a whole ton and made me not like it as much. It's, yeah, it's a guilty pleasure, but I, I like some of the characters in here and the 
uh, solution to some of the problems that are presented, especially for Kazuya, I think are uh, really dumb. And the way that he goes about it just frustrated me even more and made me like the series less and less. And me suddenly asking like, why haven't we ended this series already? <laughs> like it's going on for too long. And it is going on for too long because I think it's what, like 30 volumes of this? And this season covers up to like volume 18. Oh, we're going to be at this for a while, folks. So strap in. If you're a fan of Rent a Girlfriend, we're probably going to get like five more seasons out of it. Oh my God. Sugar Apple Fairy Tale had its second season. I did thoroughly enjoy season one. I like the whole idea of the sugar masters and the fairies and all that, and basically being a food competition show at the first arc or so. But for this second season, after winning the title of Sugar Master, Anne Halford faces uh, Shao's sudden departure. So she begins her next journey as she is determined to have him back by her side again. That leads into revelations of other fairies that are connected to the lore and history of this world. She arrives at this mansion where she is going to bake make these confections for, I believe it was the local church, and then some shenanigans happen, some adversities. So uh, lots of drama and goodness and uh, romance happen in this uh, season. Really well done by JC staff. I think this is one of their finest efforts so far. I, I really enjoyed it and it's a lot beefier. The, the material here is a lot better than in season one. There's a lot more at stake. The drama is intensified and the payoff, I think, thought was well worth it. So if you enjoyed season one, uh, do give season two a shot. I think you'll like it even more. Also, one of my favorite anime this season, The Masterful Cat is Depressed Again Today. We're following the character of Saku. She took in a stray black cat and she is a funny, wholesome girl, a hard worker, and she did not expect in a lifetime that her cat would grow up literally in size and essentially be the housekeeper of their apartment. Yukichi, the black cat, he is, think of it like either a mix of yokai and and Clifford, the big red dog, that sort of dynamic. Don't ask questions why this cat is enormous and he's able to understand human speech and do things like cook and clean and, and, and all that stuff. Just go with it and enjoy this fantasy comedy series. I say fantasy because of that element. It's not really a fantasy show, but you catch my drift. This was done by Gohans again. And I think this is even better than the girl who forgot her glasses. This was really well done. And the usage of their fisheye 3D movement lens thing was really well done, uh, brilliantly placed here with the cat's movements and all that stuff. I really enjoyed watching this. This was my Friday's stress reliever. I loved the interactions between Saku and Yukichi. I, it was super cute and wholesome and very heartwarming when you find out the story of how she ended up taking uh, this black cat and how he grew up with her and how now that he's had a home, he views her or humans differently. It's very heartwarming. If you're a pet owner, if you like pets, it's going to tug at your heartstrings while also make you laugh at the absurdity. And yes, absolutely. If I had a cat that could do that and was big enough to cook and, and, and help around the house and all that stuff, that would be amazing. So wish fulfillment anime, I don't mind. I welcome it. So definitely check out The Masterful Cat is Depressed Again today. I think it's solid. Yukichi's reactions to everything that Saku does is hilarious and he's definitely definitely the, the backbone and, and heart of this series. The gene of AI. The future is here and a new species lives among people, humanoids. Similar to man, these robotic beings are highly sentient and suffer from unique ailments. Thankfully, Dr. Hikaru Sudo can help. He vows to treat the humanoids even by illegal means, causing him to lead a double life. But when a strange disease emerge as a result of his coexistence, ethical lines become blurred. Story-wise, I do think this is one of the best shows. I genuinely had a good time watching this. It's not going to win any awards, and it's sort of of the huge dark horse of the year and an underdog 
for the anime season but yeah i i enjoyed it i thought this was very unique i love that it's a fictional work in the near future i think that's what it was labeled as where you have every episode uh different cases and it's sort of played out like mini episodic stage plays of the ailments that these humanoids suffer so you get like 15 minutes per story um or, or in this case two stories per episode i should add where you have cases of humanoids becoming erratic or behaving in abnormal ways around the people that care for them or they might have a life together with humans stuff like that and hikaru's process to treating them and finding a cure it doesn't necessarily always works so it leaves you on a sour note or a cliffhanger that doesn't need a resolution it's more about the experience and what you thought of it and not necessarily bringing us a definitive uh, ending point for that plot so i liked that aspect of gene of ai i thought this was a greatly written show wonderful dialogue and it doesn't bog you down with the specifics of of uh, the world building with the technology and how the humanoids are supposed to work. You don't really need to fully grasp that. You can enjoy the series for what it is, presenting very human problems in the near future and trying to find some solution and, and understanding life when all these new elements are present. So if that piques your interest, I think you're gonna have a fun time with the gene of AI. Definitely check that out. I don't think it's gonna get the love it deserves. So if this this video can help it out in some shape or form, I'm more than happy to continue recommending this series. Bleach Thousand Year Blood War The Separation. This is the second part of the Thousand Year Blood War adaptation, the last part of the Bleach manga. And I gotta say, I liked the first part. I thought it was great having everybody back. Studio PRO obviously evolved immensely. The art is amazing. But in this second part, out of the 12 episodes, or 13, I think, I don't know, it was mostly, I would say, 90% fights of the week with the different characters and the Soul Reaper captains and lieutenants against the Quincy's. So every episode was a different captain taking on a different Quincy. You see their abilities. The Soul Reaper has an amazing technique that we've never seen before. He fights off the Quincy. The Quincy reveals that he has a secret technique that we've never seen before. They trade blows back and forth and there's a winner and a loser by the end of it. And then the next episode, we do that with another set of characters. So that's 90% of this season, which is great if you're a fan of these characters, but I kind of wanted more. <laughs> also, the biggest part are the final three or four episodes when the bad guys take the fight to the royal palace with Squad Zero. That's definitely the highlight of the entire set of episodes. And by the end of it, it's a very underwhelming season finale. Obviously, we're gearing up for the next batch of episodes and the final confrontations and all that epic stuff that happens towards the end. But this middle portion here was just all right. Nothing too crazy, in my opinion. It was cool to see the characters back, but it was just OK. For some strange reason, I decided to watch one other isekai, and that was Am I Actually the Strongest? After being a shut-in, Haruto is reincarnated as a baby, and amazingly, the baby is a prince. However, he's abandoned in a forest on the day he's born because of his low magical level. What will be the fate of Haruto, who has inadvertently given 1,000 times the normal amount of magic by the goddess of reincarnation without anyone noticing? That sounds like a fun little weird premise, and it's alright. <laughs> uh, I do like the fact that he starts out as a baby and he is spared spoilers and one of the locals uh, picks him up and raises him and you see his development as a young kid but it doesn't go the Mushiko Tensei route which we're going to talk about later this is a much more wholesome meets ecchi tropes if you will so as Haruto grows older he is protecting his family but then he finds out that the royals uh, don't necessarily know that he survived but he, if they did find out it could spell doom and disaster for his family so he's going to protect them. Uh, the queen is a little bit cuckoo, so he's wary of that, and he makes up this uh, Code Geass uh, Lelouch type persona to act sort of like a vigilante to fight across the kingdom. It's it's all right. It's very middle of the road for me. I was not thoroughly enjoying it, but again, I don't know. I'm a masochist, I guess, and I wanted to keep going so that I could keep that 20 anime mark for the season. Uh, I thought it was all right. It, it got silly 
familiar as it went on and I was less interested than I was at the beginning, if that's an indication for my excitement of this series. We also had the second season of Eden Zero, the conclusion. All, I believe it was 25 episodes or 26 episodes. The first one dealt with uh, Draken, and then the second one, we saw some really major developments with Ziggy, who is now back and meaner and hates all humans and wants to do a revolt and uh, bring about robot supremacy across the cosmos. Obviously, Shiki is upset because that's his grandpa, and it goes into some interesting plot elements of discrimination and class which I was not expecting from a Hiromashima creation, but that's really cool. I really enjoy the characters. I'm still a fan of Rebecca. I love the fact that she is essentially a futuristic YouTuber and she doesn't have a lot of views, but she's trying, which I can relate to that. So I will forever like that character <laughs> for that specific reason. But yeah, overall better than the first season. If you enjoyed the first set of episodes, you're going to love this. And the plot developments toward the end hint at the next stuff, which looks amazing amazing and I don't want to spoil myself. I'm, I'm going to wait for season three or I'm going to pick up the manga and continue reading from here. But I'm really excited to see what's happening because yeah, it, it, stuff's about to go down with the Aoi cosmic war. So yeah. Mushiko Tensei Jobless Reincarnation is finally back with the second season. I did not know where the story was headed. I haven't read the light novels. I have not checked out the manga. I am strictly experiencing this story through the anime. I made that choice when I watched season one, which I really enjoyed. Uh, Rudius is a flawed character. So I was very surprised to see people shocked at some of the content and decisions that he made when that's kind of the whole point of this series right of his second journey and fixing some of those flaws and and facing some of those issues and uh mental issues and all that stuff so i i mean yeah it's some of the content is a little deplorable but it's within reason of his character and the world that he's around right does that make sense i thought it was okay i liked the season as it went along and ended up really enjoying the finale rudius has a problem downstairs so essentially the whole season is trying to cure some ed that he's suffering because of the heartache that happened at the end of season one which i won't spoil just in case but it made for some interesting interactions with characters we finally have a reunion from Rudius and one of his childhood friends from the first season, and that being the elf Sylphie, which I was really excited for because I like the character of Sylphie a lot, and the path that they go on is interesting. I hope it's six. Please don't spoil it for me in the comment section, but I'm excited for the possibilities and can't wait for uh, the second part, I guess, of season two, which should be in spring of next year. That's gonna be a long wait. And obviously, the art i have to speak about it for a bit because studio bind they were created for the sole purpose of adapting all of bushiko tensei obviously they're going to work on other shows right because it's a brand new studio they are doing amazing things the art on bushiko tensei is clean beautiful to look at everything's just top notch and this is a studio to look out for whenever they do other uh, anime so definitely give it a watch i do think you'll like it just be mindful that the story goes places it's not black and white there is a very grayish middle line that the characters cross and it makes for some interesting discussions just be wary of that Next up is Dark Gathering. After a devastating encounter with a restless spirit, ghost-fearing psychic Keitaro becomes a shut-in to avoid additional spectral catastrophes. But no man is a haunted island, and Keitaro eventually reintegrates with society by getting a part-time job as a tutor to the child prodigy Yayoi Hozuki. Yayoi isn't just an academic genius, though. She's a talented psychic medium, hell-bent on finding the malevolent spirit behind her mother's disappearance, and she's gravely determined to drag Keitaro into her terrifying world of grotesque supernatural phenomenon. I was really excited for Dark Gathering. I think this is a solid looking show. I like the manga and I think OLM did a commendable job of bringing it to life. I love the voice acting on this one and the supernatural stuff is really freaky and eerie. Even though it looks cartoonish, it does tug at your spine and some of the, the images on that show 
they're, they, they're pretty frightening. I, I gotta say, sometimes I, even I felt a little bit spooked when I finished an episode. Of course, I was watching it in the middle of the night, but you know, that, that's how you gotta watch a horror themed anime, right? I thought the relationship that forms between Keitaro and Yayoi is great, super nice, cute, and wholesome. The fact that Keitaro, even though he's scared of what he's doing, he knows that at the end of the day, he has to step up because he is taking care as a tutor uh, for this young girl and they push forward and they're capturing these spirits so that she can eventually uh, find the bigger one that took her mom. So that's pretty exciting and gives us an end goal uh, for the plot. So yeah, really excited to keep checking out Dark Gathering. The second part of the season is currently airing. So yeah, I'm excited. Uh, hopefully it ends on a high note, season one. Now, before we go into the final show that I watched for the summer season, unfortunately, we've come to the part of the video where we have to celebrate the shows that I personally canceled and dropped. So rest in peace, anime. You were not that great, but you tried. The final anime that we're going to talk about is ZOM 100, Bucket List of the Dead. I really like the premise for this. It's unconventional. You are deconstructing the zombie genre by adding a new flavor, a new twist to it. Instead of just a straight up survival story in a zombie apocalypse, it's more about fulfilling your desires, crossing those bucket list items and finding a life worth living and not being bogged down by uh, all the negativity and all the bad stuff that has happened in your life and not letting that define who you are as a person. That is the core theme here for Zomb 100. It just so happens to take place in the middle of a freaking zombie apocalypse. So yeah, I love me some zombies. I, I'm a huge fan of that genre, uh, one of my favorites when it comes to horror. And I think Zomb 100 is very cool and inventive when it does its thing with the zombies. Uh, this is done by Bug Films, a brand new studio adapting the manga. I think they've done a phenomenal job the first couple of episodes are near movie quality as far as i'm concerned unfortunately this new studio is having a bit of a hassle uh some technical issues and as of me making this video the show the first season did not end we still have three more episodes to go and we don't have actual release dates for those episodes so i don't know when it's gonna end it could be tomorrow it could be a week from now who knows we'll see but i do think they do a good job of bringing the manga to life it's pretty spot on to the original page I do prefer the original art though, but overall just a, a, a nice adaptation of a cool zombie apocalypse manga. Definitely check out ZOM 100 if you're in the mood for something a little bit different and you don't mind the grotesque images when it comes to uh, the creature horror stuff. So yeah, definitely give ZOM 100 a shot. So that's it. Another summer season down. What's next? Fall. Oh, that should be fine. Oh, Lord have mercy. <laughs> well, looks like I got my work cut out for me. Going to be an intense three months. So we'll be back for that whenever we do the fall season 2023. Look forward to that soon on the channel. What did you think of the summer anime season? If you watched any of these shows, let me know in the comments section down below. Thank you once again for liking, subscribing, and being a part of the manga geekdom here on YouTube. Truly do appreciate it. God bless. Stay safe out there. I will catch all of you on our next episode.